Welcome back. So today we're talking about the residual network or ResNet architecture, which is one of the most important modern uh, deep recurrent neural network architectures um, used in all kinds of applications from uh, super resolution to you know, image classification to modeling physical systems like ordinary differential equations. Okay, good, so let's jump right into it. Um, so generally speaking, we might want to be modeling some input output function uh, using a neural network. So our inputs uh, X and our outputs Y. The relationship between these could be some uh, function F that we're trying to approximate with a neural network. And I really like motivating ResNets with a super resolution example because I think this makes the most intuitive sense to me where maybe X is a low res image of something like this fluid flow. And my goal with this neural network is to get an output Y that is a high resolution, a, a super resolution version of that image. Now, there's lots of ways of doing this, but the idea, kind of the intuitive idea behind ResNet uh, or residual network is instead of trying to learn this mapping from X to Y, why don't I take and create a copy of X and only try to model the difference between X and the desired output Y? Because in this super resolution task, most of the information in the output Y actually does already exist in this low resolution uh, input X. And there is a relatively small residual F that captures all of the little features that I'm trying to model here. So we'll get into why this is a good idea later, and this is a good idea for lots and lots and lots of reasons. If I want to make an increasingly deep neural network, oftentimes it uh, is hard to remember the input X over many, many, many layers. There's this kind of notion of forgetting in neural networks over many, many layers, it's easy to forget the original input X. And in lots of cases, the output is actually pretty close to X, so we don't wanna forget that input. And so residual networks are a really, really powerful idea introduced in 2015 that essentially allows us to train much, much deeper networks without forgetting the input at the final stages of the network. And essentially, you know, this idea of, a, of modeling only the residual, so you create a copy of the input and you add to it some residual F that captures all of the little kind of delta changes from input to output. It's a really clever idea, and it also makes a lot of sense if you think about, um, like if you're like me and your background is in applied math and computational science, this makes a lot of sense that oftentimes we would only want to spend our effort modeling the residual, the thing that we don't know between X and Y. So really, really cool um, architecture and easily motivated by this super resolution example. We're only going to model the small differences between these two figures um, that we need to. Okay, good. Um, so this is going to be the, the kind of schematic of what we're trying to do. We're trying to go from inputs to outputs, and we're going to essentially create this identity copy of our input, and we're going to add to it all of the stuff that our neural network uh, thinks is important to get to this output Y. And this is kind of the standard generic set uh, of items that go into a ResNet block. In principle, this is pretty customizable. You don't have to use this cookie cutter ResNet block. You could, uh, you could do other things. You could use other activation functions, other kinds of normalization and convolutional networks. But the basic idea, if you're going to build a ResNet, is to have these kind of uh, pieces here where you might have some kind of a convolutional layer um, some normalization, some activation function, another conv layer, another normalization. Uh, and then once you add this X back to itself, you'll then go through a final ReLU activation um, in the kind of standard ResNet block. Now you'll notice that if I have these convolutional layers with stride one and padding of one, kind of the input dimensions in the input side of this and the output dimensions on the output side of this are the same size. So that's really good if I want to go, if I want to process, you know, where X and Y are kind of the same size objects. Now this might be a little confusing in the example I gave earlier because this is a low resolution version of this. 
But what you would do is you would take this low res image and you would basically just um, create a version of it that is as high of a resolution as your desired output Y, where each of these little blocks is just you know, repeated pixel values over those um, high resolution pixel blocks. So you can basically create a high resolution image um, you know, from this low resolution image where each of these little uh, square blocks might have like nine pixels of the exact same value inside of them. And so now this kind of low resolution image still has the same number of pixels as this desired high resolution output image. So X and Y are the same kind of size, if you, if you like. So um, that is the kind of idea here of um, you know, using stride one and pad one is that you can have your inputs and outputs be the same size, so the same size image. And again, just the motivation behind this, I think at least one of the main motivations was we knew after 2012, after kind of the big success um, on ImageNet, that the deeper the neural network, typically the better performance you could get on these really hard tasks in image classification and natural language processing. And so the push after 2012 was to make deeper and deeper and deeper networks. But oftentimes you had these really, really nasty problems of forgetting your input signal, and it was hard to train these deep neural networks because backpropagation would get um, you know, a little bit ill-conditioned and finicky. And so this ResNet block here that essentially bypasses some of those issues by having this jump connection or skip connection as it's called, where you create a copy of the input and just kind of manually add it forward after the neural network models the residual, that allows you to train these much, much deeper neural networks without forgetting and typically um, having a better backpropagation of, of loss errors. And so this is kind of a schematic of the ResNet architecture used in this uh, CVPR 2015 paper, and you can see that it's you know super super deep, right? 34 layer plan, uh, plane, 34 layer residual, really really deep network, deeper than other networks at the time had been able to achieve and train reliably. So that's one of the huge um, benefits of these ResNets is that you can go deeper, which we know gives us more expressive capability for really really hard problems if we have enough training data and enough computational resources. A um, couple points I wanna make. I showed you this ResNet block where you have these kind of convolutional layers that are designed to keep X and Y as the same size. So if I wanna go from image to image, this is a good ResNet block. You can also use these for classification tasks where you wanna go from something big like an image down to a small set of distilled kind of features for classification. The way you might do that uh, is you could, for example, have your stride equal two here. So you're actually skipping over some, uh, some pieces, but then have twice as many conv layers in here. So you can essentially um, you know, decrease the spatial dimension by a factor of two, but increase the number of, of convolutional features also by a number of two. And that's uh, typically what's done when you wanna use ResNets for a classification task, is you would take your high res image and you would change your stride um, to two and have twice as many convolutional filters, and, that, and you might do that over and over again, and it would sequentially crunch this down into a smaller set of distilled features, just like a normal kind of convolutional neural net would do. You can do the same thing here. But I like thinking about kind of image to image ResNets because also I'm gonna think about using these ResNets to model differential equations where maybe Y is going to be X stepped forward in time. So we'll get to that in just a minute. In fact, we'll get to that right now. <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the ways I think about ResNets is to take the state of a system, maybe this is a system governed by physics, and to model how it evolves forward in time. And again, you'll notice that um, a very reasonable way to do that, the best prediction of X at the next time step, step K plus one, is my model of X at the current time step plus some small residual. This is how we do Euler integration. This is how we do uh, numerical integration. So very early people made this connection that residual networks are a lot like kind of a numerical integrator. And again, we're gonna come back to that uh, in a minute. 
And this notation also helps here when you look at this really, really big residual network architecture where each layer um, you know, corresponds to a, a, an integer k. So there might be like you know, k1 through 34 in, uh, you know, in this big, deep residual network over here. And just some highlights I wanted to point out. Um, so this was introduced by Microsoft. Uh, as I mentioned before, it allows you to train much, much deeper networks without forgetting the input and also uh, makes it easier to kind of back propagate through this very deep network. This paper has been one of the most influential papers in the entire machine learning uh, literature. It has over 100,000 citations um, at the time of this filming. It's a super, super important, uh, important paper. And it's really based on this idea, this kind of uh, intuitive idea, that I don't just want to build some map from X to Y. Often, X and Y are pretty related, and I want to model the difference between X and Y, the residual between X and Y. And we do that by having this jump connection or skip connection. So that jump or skip connection is really the key idea here in this residual network. Uh, and when it came out, this is a really, part of the reason this is such an impactful paper with 100,000 plus citations is that when this paper came out, it was a pretty competitive field. Lots of groups were developing, you know, really high performance classifiers and, you know, neural networks for, for images. And when this one came out in 2015, it beat all of the other methods on three of the biggest benchmark problems, on ImageNet, on COCO, and on CIFAR-10. One kind of first ranking in all of those right out of the gate. That's how you get people's attention, is to introduce a new architecture that just you know, cleans up all of the, the leaderboards on the popular benchmarks. So pretty cool um, paper and a really cool idea. And again, it's very closely related to numerical integration, in particular uh, the Euler time stepping. So that's what we're about to look at next, is how we as you know, engineers and scientists can use ideas of ResNet for modeling dynamical systems and differential equations. So again, this is the schematic picture of what's happening in this ResNet block. You have some uh, input state x, maybe you know, the, the subscript k indicates a time step, like at time k I measure my system. Uh, maybe this is all of the joints of a robot in a vector at time k, and I want to predict all of those joints in the robot at time k plus 1. Uh, and I'm going to do this by applying all of my neural network energy to model the discrepancy or the residual from time step k to k plus 1. Now again, this looks just like uh, an Euler integrator. So if I have this time step from uh, time 1 to time 2, time 2 to time 3, time 3 to time 4, time k to k plus 1, this is almost exactly how we would uh, step forward a differential equation using a very crude Euler integrator. Okay, so this uh, morally should look very, very similar uh, to Euler integration for those of you who are familiar with scientific computing. Um, and so that's a pretty cool idea that you can also do things like you can analyze stability, you can analyze numerical properties of this propagation, all kinds of things you can do um, with scientific computing you can apply to these ResNets. But it might get you thinking, well, okay, maybe I could use a better integrator. We know that Euler is kind of the worst integrator out of the gate I could design. It's very easy, but also terrible error and stability properties. Maybe I can do a ResNet with a Runge-Kutta integrator. Maybe I can do a ResNet with a symplectic or a variational integrator. And that's a really good idea, and that's actually pretty closely related uh, to one of the next videos I'm going to make on neural ODEs. So again, if we think about the residual network as kind of modeling the flow, these discrete time flow uh, of points through a differential equation, you can improve on this Euler integrator idea and try to model the continuous flow from x through uh, a differential equation x dot equals f. And that's the idea behind neural ODEs. So you basically take this ResNet idea that is a coarse um, Euler integrator and you abstract it. So now what we're modeling with our neural network is we're modeling the actual vector field that would give rise to that Euler time step. And so this has a lot of key benefits that essentially 
If I model the flow through a continuous differential equation, I can use higher order integrators. Um, I can add physical constraints like energy conservation, symplectic structure, variational structure, things like that. Um, and morally, what this is like, it's like having a lot of very, very, very small delta T ResNet layers, uh, almost like compound interest, continuously compounding you know, interest you get a much smoother and more accurate flow through those dynamics with this uh, ODE network than you do with a residual network. So anyway, for differential equations, I'm gonna make a whole video on this neural ODE and the difference between ResNet and ODE net. What I really want you to get out uh, thinking here is that ResNets were a very important step in us understanding how to use neural networks to model dynamical systems, differential equations that advance uh, forward in time. And that's given rise to one of the most powerful um, neural network architectures for differential equations, the neural ODE um, in this 2018 NeurIPS paper. So whole video on this uh, coming up soon. Okay, so that's the kind of mile high view of uh, residual networks. There is a ton of good material out there. There's PyTorch tutorials and examples. I'll put some links below, but you know, download the the you know examples. Try this out. Try it out on a you know image classification task. Try it out on a super resolution task. This is one of the most important foundational architectures out there. Um, in principle. The ideas behind the UNet architecture, which is you know central for diffusion um, kind of generative AI models, a lot of the UNet architecture feels like it's inspired by the ResNet architecture. There's a lot of these kind of jump connections and things like that. This is one of the most powerful and important architectures in modern machine learning, and it's based on this idea that instead of just modeling the map from X to Y, from inputs to outputs, maybe I want to model the residual and have this jump connection to create a copy of my input plus the residual that equals my output. Huge benefits and it has this very natural connection to differential equations, which is going to be useful for us as engineers and scientists. Okay, thank you.